Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have Professor Don Rubin uh, to give a talk here uh, at HKUST. Um, uh, I, I guess to many of us, Don Rubin doesn't need much of an introduction. Okay, but anyway, uh, so I, I, I Googled and find out a lot more I didn't know before. So mm -hmm. <laughs> let me give a very a brief introduction. So uh, uh, Professor Don Rubin is a John Loeb Professor of Statistics at Harvard and um, has made fundamental contributions to many areas uh, in statistics, including missing data, causal inference, survey sampling, Bayesian inference, computing, application to a wide range of disciplines, including psychology, education, uh, policy, law, economics, etymology, public health, etc., etc. Yeah. And I also, uh, you can also Google this yourself. And the citation is is mind blowing. Okay, <laughs> mind blowing. Uh, actually, well, uh, the, I think uh, Don Rubin is probably most famous for 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 most of for two things, right? One is actually for causal inference, uh, which he's going to talk about today, and the other one is for missing data. And if you look at the uh, the, the, the papers on EM, I think many of us heard about EM, okay? And it starts with, uh, with Professor Don Rubin. Okay? And the citation, I just look at it, it's actually 54,000 so far. So uh, it's, uh, and uh, uh, I look at my citation and it's really <laughs> humbling experience, okay? And also the, the, infer uh, the citation for the missing data, the second one is actually 24,000, okay? Huge citation numbers. Okay, uh, and um, so um, and and uh, as I said, uh, Professor Dan Rubin is, is is currently at Harvard, but he soon moved to Tsinghua University, mm. so we're much closer right. uh, to mm. Hong Kong. Mm. And uh, uh, this is the first time uh, for for Dan's visit to Hong Kong, but I believe right. uh, and will be uh, very frequent from now on. Okay, so, so. Uh, without further ado, yeah, let's uh, give uh, Dan Rubin a uh, well. Well, thanks very much for the really uh, gracious uh, introduction, and I'm uh, not only looking forward to this uh, talk and presentation, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to returning to, to Hong Kong when I'm when I'm uh, closer by. Uh, and so I, I'm going to I'm basically going on uh, an adventure uh, uh, at uh, Yao's Math Center in uh, at Chinhua. And I'll, I'll I'll see what we can develop in applied statistics, but this 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 talk is about causal inference, uh, and it's a, a version of a talk that I've given a few times, and it keeps changing. I keep changing these uh, these talks, and I, I use relatively few slides as relative to, to uh, most talks in statistics. There are a lot of words and there are a lot of ideas and, and concepts, and I, I always change the talk in, in subtle ways uh, to try to connect better to the audience. So the, but the title here is Essential Concepts for Causal Inference and Randomized Experiments and Observational Studies, A Remarkable History. <clears throat> and I call it a remarkable history because I, w uh, humans, have been dealing with issues of causal inference for thousands of years. The, ho the whole idea of how to make something happen in the future. What happens if I intervene in some way? What will happen in the future? For in a trivial example, you have a headache, and you're thinking, should I take an aspirin to make my headache go away? That's an intervention. What you're thinking about is, well, what will the state of my headache be in two hours if I take the aspirin? What will it be like in two hours if I don't take the aspirin? Or you're a hunter. You think, where should I go hunting today? Should I go north or should I go south? If I go north, I'll waste time and maybe I'll catch something. If I go south, maybe I'll waste time and maybe I won't catch something. So you're trying to make decisions. And decisions are always based on causal inference. That's what it means. And you kind of contemplate what the consequence of making a decision is. And I call it a remarkable history. This is something that really has only become clear to me in the, in the last few years, is it's amazing how recent a real understanding of causal inference is. Uh, and and the, in the, because people have been doing it probably for 100,000 years, as long as mankind has been around. But there hasn't been a, a good understanding of what it really is. 
until I think the 19th century. That's kind of amazing to think about how long humans have been around and making decisions, but not having any sort of formal mathematical framework for making those decisions. So for example, I, without one of the points that in the written version of this, if I ever get around to writing it, is that famous philosophers like John Stuart Mill, who talked about uh, causal inference all the time, really didn't know what they were talking about. They were totally confused. The people who didn't know what they were talking about were the people who never did any formal mathematics on it, uh, on causal inference, and people who did real experiments, who were animal breeders or plant, or plant uh, agronomists who were trying to figure out what, what fertilizer to use. So I will I'll try to uh, make this, this point in the context of, of, uh, of, of this talk and try to point out why I think it really is a 20th century phenomena the understanding of, of, of causal inference. And ha it has some connection to other ideas in quantum mechanics that really grew up, uh, grew about the same time. And why they, there's a connection there, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, I know what the connection is, but why they grew up at the same time in the Copenhagen School of Quantum Mechanics, why it grew up about the same time is very unclear to me. But these things happen in, in, um, in, in history. So uh, I start out. So I, let's see if I know how to do this. The other way, huh? OK. So I have to hold it the other way, too. I guess it works. Otherwise, you, it's left. I'm, it's like I'm Hebrew or something and trying to go, read the wrong way. Uh, so this is a, a, so a prologue to this talk on, on causal inference uh, that, that talks about how I got into this, this field and why I think about uh, the, the cause difference the way I do. Like a lot of kids, when I was in, in, in high school, when I was you know, a teenager, <clears throat> a, a young, young teenager, I was interested in, uh, in studying math and physics. But in fact, when I, was a, when I was a kid, I liked math, but I was far more interested in, in physics, the real, the real science. And, and math was just a tool, and I really wasn't fascinated by, uh, by math per se. I, I really... Uh, like to, 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 to do physics. And when I went to college, I entered Princeton in 1961. <clears throat> and I, uh, I was in this program that uh, a guy named John Wheeler, who was a, a physicist at, at Princeton, uh, had introduced, where he took kids who had a lot of advanced placements in high school. And his plan, his plan unknown to us, was to get us a PhD from Princeton from entering as a freshman in five years. So not only an undergraduate degree, but also a PhD. Nobody did. Every, everybody dropped out. Uh, uh, but it was an interesting program. And if, for those of you who haven't heard about the name John Wheeler, he was a relatively famous physicist. He was uh, well known, he is well known, was well known, because he died at age 96, maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, for, for a couple things. <clears throat> First of all, if you look him up in Wikipedia, he's, he's uh, uh, given credit for inventing the name black holes, uh, a, star, a collapsing star that's so dense even photons can't escape from it. And despite the fact that he's, uh, he's given credit for that, he always denied it. Uh, he said he was giving a lecture like this to maybe a, a couple hundred people, and he was describing what a black hole was, and somebody in the audience shouted out, oh, it's a black hole! You know? And so it was an audience like this, and, he, and he, he finished the lecture, and he tried to find the guy who, who uh, shouted out black hole so he could uh, attribute it to him, but he never found him. <laughs> but he loved the name, so he kept using it. And so he, it, it got attributed to him, because he was the guy using the name, but he never found out who, who the guy who really made it up was. The other thing that Wheeler is probably best known for is uh, he's the PhD advisor of probably the most famous American physicist, Richard Feynman, so, uh, who is the Nobel Prize winning uh, American physicist who was at Princeton for years and then went to Caltech. Uh, and there, there's some things when I, when I sort of looked at some of Feynman's lectures that seem obvious to me that he's saying and, and as if they're, they're, they're brilliant ideas. And of course, the reason they're obvious to me is I was told them by Wheeler. And, he t and Wheeler told them to Feynman too. Uh, and Wheeler, he never won a Nobel Prize. He probably should have. 
uh, in, in physics. Uh, but he, uh, there are two things that uh, I remember that was striking about this introductory lecture that I, that I heard from him when I was 17 years old. Uh, and one was just because you read it in a well-known place, in a, f in a famous textbook or a famous article, don't necessarily believe it. And in 1961, when I was taking this freshman class, there was one example that he had in this big fat textbook that we had. It was a standard textbook then, and I think it's probably still a standard textbook in physics. It was called Halliday and Resnick. It was a big fat yellow text. It was in a chapter on electromagnetism and vectors, I think, or something like that. <clears throat> and it was a sort of a talkie proof, you know, not a formal math proof, but a talkie proof about how you cannot have coherent light. What's coherent light? There's coherent light. There's, but there was a proof in this book that was published in 1959, I think, why you cannot have co coherent light. I think about a year later, uh, Bell Labs invented it. So just because there's a, there's a statement somewhere that something is true, don't necessarily believe it, unless you really understand it. And that's, a, uh, I think, a very important comment that when I read current uh, statistics papers, often I, most of them are, a lot of them are, don't believe them, just because it's published in a, quote, respectable place. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't mean it's true. Another thing that, that Wheeler did in, the, in this first lecture is he gave us a problem to, to take home. <clears throat> Problem was, how far can a wild goose fly? And he didn't want the exact answer, because obviously some wild geese can fly farther than others. But he wanted, what are the principles that you're going to use to ad address the problem? Well, a wild goose has to fly. When he's flying, he has to stay up, right? So he, he floats current. But basically, he's burning fat to com to create energy to stay up, right? That's what, that's what the principle is. So how much, how much can a wild goose weigh? And how do you convert kinet, uh, potential energy ki uh, to kinetic energy? Because gravity is constantly pulling you down. So can you do the, can you just get the principles of the calculation and then get an approximate answer that makes sense? Can a wild goose fly five times around the Earth? That doesn't make any sense. Could there be no genetic, there be no uh, advantage to a wild goose who can fly that far? So how, how, you know, how far can, can it fly? So the point was, get the principles right. Don't worry about the details. And I think one of the uh, things that stuck with me uh, from that is the fact that so much of statistics is pretty dismal in that it worries about details that don't really matter. It's far more important to get the big ideas right and understand the principles than to get the uh, tedious details right. So, so th this, this thing was, was, was very uh, important to me. And also, went to, uh, what does it have to do with causal inference? Well, it has to do with the fact that you want to learn about something, you do an experiment in physics. You know, how, how fast will a rolling ball down a plane, inclined plane, be, be at the end if you let start it here? Well, it's about the friction of the plane. You, you, you do experiments to sort of convert, confirm that something you're doing makes sense. So causal inference has to do with interventions. You do something, and, you, and then you find out what happens. So this was very consistent with what I learned in, in, in high school, because in, in, in high school, I had a great teacher. I was really lucky to have a great teacher. And the ideas of quantum mechanics were already available, even when I was in high school, in the, in the 1950s. So uh, I sort of understood something. I understood some of the ideas, at least. Uh, and the idea of experimentation was, was really part of that. There was another guy at Princeton who greatly influenced me. And it was a guy named Julian Jaynes, who I met about 1964. And Julian was a psychologist, and, but a very deep thinker. Not very mathematical, but, but you don't have to be mathematical to be a good thinker. There's no doubt about that. And uh, Julian was big on consciousness. What does it mean to be conscious? And he wrote a book that was eventually published about, I think, 1975, called The Origin of Consciousness in the breakdown of the bicameral mind. 
kind of a long title, but a, a very deep idea. If, if you think about I ideas, human beings understanding things, well, we understand them through our brain. <clears throat> and how is our brain structured? Well, there are two hemispheres. So it's bicameral, two houses. That's where the phrase uh, bicameral comes from. Uh, and his theory was that for th tens of thousands of years, people were basically unconscious. That doesn't mean they're, they're lying, they're sleeping, but they're not conscious in the, in the sense that they realized what thinking was about. It was an internal conversation between your two hemispheres. And so the idea of the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind says that for tens of thousands of years, people thought by hearing voices coming from the two hemispheres. So voices, language was older than consciousness. So in fact, in, uh, in, in, in this book he wrote, he claimed that the Old Testament was largely written, the Old Testament in you know, Jewish, Christian, Muslim religion was basically written by unconscious people. People who didn't realize the conversation between your two hemispheres was just that, it was con that it was conversation between two hemispheres and they thought it was voices from gods, for example. And so that's why the Greeks and Romans had all these gods. God of war, God of love, God of sex, God of wine, because it was, it was a conversation taking place between your two, two hemispheres and you interpreted the different voices as, as being different gods. And so, for example, in the Old Testament, uh, there are phrases like, or expressions or words like, uh, last night, God came to me in the middle of the night, sat down in bed with me, told me to do this, told me this is the way I should, I should win the war. God of war told me. You know, Mars, the Roman god of war, Ares, came to me and, and told me this. Whereas in the New Testament, which is mainly written by conscious people, I had a dream last night. And in the dream, God came to me and told me this. That's the conscious person's version. The unconscious person would say the same thing, but the God was there telling him what to do. So for example, also the Iliad and the Odyssey were written by unconscious people, the claim was. And unconscious people were really susceptible to deceit, for example. And uh, so the, the Trojan horse, uh, we've been trying to capture you for, Months, we're going to give up and make you a gift, the Trojan horse. Take it as a gift. Of course, it's full of soldiers. So, but that was unconscious people because they were so, so unaware. It was, not that they were stupid, but they're unaware uh, of people. They were easily deceived. And why is this important? Because again, people have to filter things through their brains. And I think one of the important concepts of causality is it has to be filtered through your brain. And you have to be relatively sophisticated to really understand, not only understand causality, but have the mathematical notation to, to, to deal with it. And that's what I'll, what I'll be uh, developing here a little bit. When I went to graduate school uh, at, at Harvard, I was, was in various departments. I floated around a little bit. Uh, and uh, when I finally got into statistics, one of the first courses I took was from uh, my uh, Scottish statistician advisor, William Cochrane. And uh, the course was on ex classical experimental design. Completely consistent with what I, I brought up learning in, in physics, but it was now even more formal. As if you want to do an experiment, this is how you should do it. You should do it as a split plot or a randomized block. Randomization was part of it, but part of it was that it was completely consistent with, with what I'd learned earlier in physics uh, and, and how, you, how you think about e experiments. If you want to know with what happens if you do something, you really should be able to do an experiment and see how it's done. The, the big advance, which I didn't see back then as a big advance, was randomization, classic randomized experiments. But that's my sort of background. Uh, in my, until I got my, a PhD in 1970, of what I, where I came from. And, be, and these are people all who I greatly admired, and so I'm obviously influenced by, by that. I'm not saying any of this is true. 
I'm saying, but this is this is how I was brought up, and, and so that, that's why I I started do, doing things the way I I did them. And when I started doing things that way, and I still find it now that a lot of people say, oh no, that's wrong. That's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about cause limbs is you do regressions, you do predictions, and that's everything else. Put in indicator variables for treatments. No, that's wrong. And it's wrong, I'm not saying it really is wrong, I'm saying it was wrong to me, it was wrong to me from the time I can remember, because that's not the way I was brought up. Uh, and the incredibly important concept, I'm not, again, I'm not saying it's true, but I'm saying it, be, it became pride of something that I believed, is that when you do uh, inference, there's a clear separation between science, what you're trying to learn about, and what you do to learn about the science. And the world exists, the universe exists, and it has a state. And if you want to learn about that, you intervene. You intervene and you measure something. You measure something. And what you measure is supposed to be measuring what the, what the, what the science was at the time that you intervened. But the measurement can't influence what the science was before you measure it. But the measurement, the act of measuring it, can influence what the state of the world will be in the future, the state of the science in the future. As a result of this, you had the same notation, the representation of science, which exists back then, no matter how you try to measure or, or learn about it. A very simple application of that idea is whether you try to learn about the effect of a medicine or uh, some sort of therapy like um, hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women or any drug therapy, why do we require randomized experiments to approve drugs? If, that, if, the, if the science, the truth, the, the true medical facts will differ if you try to learn about it through a randomized experiment or in a doctor's office, why bother doing a randomized experiment? No, because this, it's sort of a tenet of, 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 this, of, of the approach that the world exists and it's out there, there's truth. There's a truth out there and you try to learn about the truth. And then uh, when you learn about the truth, you make decisions for what to do in the future. And there's the same notation and representation of the science, meaning the medicine, the medical effects of these drugs, no matter how you try to learn about it. So the act of learning, whether it's through a randomized experiment or taking records in a, do in a doctor's medical office, that doesn't change the truth as it exists before you did the measurements. So you have the same notation and representation of science, no matter how you try to learn about or measure it. Fundamentally important idea. Another fundamentally important idea is that missing data always exist. You cannot go back in time. So, if, so the ba back to the future doesn't exist. Maybe fun movies, but I'm not saying that's actually true. I'm saying that's something I grew up believing. And so I, I, I believe that back to the future the, is fantasy. You can't go back to the future. You can't go back and forth in time. So missing data always exists. If you want to know what the effect of taking an aspirin versus not taking an aspirin now, the effect of that on your headache in two hours, either take the aspirin or you don't take the aspirin. If you take the aspirin, you see what your headache is like with the aspirin. You can't go back in time and undo the taking of the aspirin and not take the aspirin. So the causal inference is the effect of taking the aspirin versus not taking the aspirin only one of which you can ever see. It doesn't mean that it can't be defined, the effect of taking the aspirin. I can define something that I can't measure. And that's the essential idea, and that's why it turns out it's a remarkable history, because no one really got that idea. They sort of babbled about it, but they didn't get the notation right, they didn't get the mathematics right. Missing data always exists, you cannot go back in time. Even in high school, I sort of knew this, you know, that, you, that you, can, you can define things that you can't measure. Well, that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? It's quantum mechanics. You can't measure both momentum and position at the same point in time. You, you, 
Yeah, there's this uncertainty that's you know, Planck's constant and all that sort of stuff, Copenhagen School. So that, that was, I grew up believing that. And there's Heisenberg, but it was something that's sometimes confused with it, is the observer effect. The act of observing something changes its state for the future. So you can't go back in time and undo, undo the taking of aspirin or undo the fact that you bombarded a particle with, with photons to, or electrons to, to measure its position and, and momentum. So the, you, you can't go back in time. Therefore, missing data always exists because that's what the cause effect is. It involves missing data. Comparison of your headache taking the aspirin and not taking the aspirin. So these things just were sort of obvious to me, not because I'm saying, not because they're true or because I was so brilliant, I was brought up believing it. And as a kid who was very successful uh, believing it because they seemed to work. You know, we, we could create lots of things from b believing these, in these principles. So that's just a prologue. That's a, where, I, where I, I was when I started to, to, to do some work. So where are some essential ideas? Am I doing it backwards again? Oh, I want to go forward. That's right. That's what I want to do. Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's remarkable. And one of the first essential ideas is due to a statistician, I think, Sir Ronald Fisher, who is uh, probably the, uh, the greatest uh, statistician. Uh, and uh, he basically said in 1925 that you should actually randomize. If you want to c compare fertilizer A with fertilizer B on plots of land, you should basically toss coins to see which, which plots got fertilizer A, which plots got fertilizer B. And uh, why should you do that? Well, there was a lot of talk about why you should do that. Uh, thereby, you create balance on all pretreatment variables in expectation. So in if you're doing it randomly, really randomly, the plots that got exposed to fertilizer A will, on average, look just like the plots that got exposed to fertilizer B. And therefore, you can compare, for example, the average effect across the plots of fertilizer A versus fertilizer B. So that's, uh, now people, a lot of people talked about that. But Fisher, as far as I can see, was the first to actually say, you should do that. You should actually do it not just talk about it. So the, the, and I'll say something about, about, about the difference uh, be, between those two positions uh, in a subsequent slide. Recondite advice, sort of uh, hidden advice, was if you got a bad allocation just by randomly doing the, this random allocation, like all the males got the active treatment and all the females got the control treatment, should you live with that randomization? And that's what Fisher wrote, that you should, but that's not what he thought. Because he was, he was advocating the use of randomized experiments, and so you, you don't want to talk about its complications. And actually, this, this whole idea of re-randomizing to get a, a better allocation is a very modern I, idea that only, only can be implemented with modern computing. And there's a sequence of, of articles that have uh, I just got published uh, with, where I was advocating this with, with various co-authors. Co One of them was published in the Annals of Statistics in 1968, the first one. Then there was another one published in, in uh, 19, no, 2000, so I'm sorry, uh, 2006 and 2008 in Journal of the American Statistical Association, Theory and Methods. And then there's another one published, just is going to appear in Biometrica on the same topic, another one to appear in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. It just got accepted. Um, pointing, pointing out what, how, how you do this correctly, and, and if I had time for more lectures, I'd actually talk about this because it's kind of interesting because it's, uh, it's one of the few examples where really practical procedures don't lead to asymptotically normal distributions. Instead, these really sensible procedures lead, uh, lead to the asymptotic distributions being mixtures, mixtures of truncated normals and, and untruncated normals that you couldn't even contemplate doing 15 years ago, but now you can essentially do it using your telephone because the computation has advanced so much. <clears throat> 
so I, that's a great area for, for research. Uh, but, that, but Fisher didn't propose that. So Fisher proposed this actually randomizing in the last chapter of Statistical Methods for Research Workers that was published in 1925. And a lot of people don't realize it was, it was actually proposed back then because they look at more recent editions of, of Statistical Methods for Research Workers. And it was, this was in the, the final chapter in the first edition. And in the subsequent editions, this topic, doing randomized experiments correctly, became so important that Fisher wrote a book on it called Design of Experiments that was published in 1935. And having a whole book on the topic, why do you need a chapter in, in another book? So he, he yanked the chapter from the first book. So in all subsequent editions of Statistical Methods for Research Workers, which people look at and they don't realize there's a first edition, they think, oh, well, Fisher didn't propose that until 1935. That's not true. They don't look at the first edition. If you want to see what somebody really thought, look at the early editions. Um, another uh, incredibly important contribution of Fisher's 1925 was in order to assess significance levels, confidence intervals, all those sorts of inference, inference about the size of the effect, you hypothetically re-randomize. So Fisher was a really good mathematician. And, and with the idea of re-randomization is assume what you want to prove wrong. It's like the square root of two. How do you prove the square root of two is irrational? You know, it's proof by contradiction. You assume something is true that you want to prove wrong. So it's a, here is the, the null hypothesis that there is no effect of the tr active treatment, fertilizer A versus fertilizer B. If you assume that's true, you know what would have happened in all possible randomizations, not just the one you're looking at. And this was, was an, an idea that had sort of been floating around for hundreds of years. And I'll give an example of, of, of how it's, it's completely intuitive. Let's suppose you're thinking of having uh, dinner somewhere in, in Hong Kong tonight and you decide to go to a new restaurant. Well, you've been to 100 restaurants before, let's say. And you have a mental histogram of the quality of these 100 restaurants. So you have a history. Here's good, bad, you know, the bad are over here, the really good ones are over here. So you have a histogram of the quality, depending upon how many times you've been there. And now you'll, you go to a new restaurant, and it's the best restaurant you've ever been to. So it's the best of all 100 you might say it's significantly better than the other ones. And if you've been to 100 other ones, what would the significance level be? Well, you have 100, and well, this is the best of 100. So its p-value is one out of 100, the percentile value. It's a very old idea. It's been around for thousands of years. If I have a, if I have a history of, of, of yields of different kind of fertilizer, and I get a new fertilizer that some guys say, hey, this is really great stuff. It's nitrate or something. And you see the yield of the plants is the best you've ever seen. You say, yeah, that's, that's great. It's significantly better than the old ones. And Fisher's blast of insight, which no one, I think, ever thought of before, you can get this historical distribution without ever looking at the history. All you have to do is... is have a proof by contradiction. You assume the null hypothesis is true, that there is no difference between fertilizer A and fertilizer B. And then you know what you would have seen under all possible randomizations. That's a real blast of insight. But you have to be a, a good mathematician because you have to understand a proof by contradiction. Something when I was talking about these kinds of things with uh, Yao, uh, you know, who's at uh, Chenhua in Beijing and, and at Harvard, is that although Chinese have been doing mathematics for thousands and thousands of years and doing good mathematics for thousands and thousands of years, the Chinese never had the idea of proof by contradiction. In those thousands of years of doing mathematics, they never understood that idea. They never used it. The Greeks did. The Greeks invented it. And the Chinese never did. You've done lots of great stuff. But Yao says you never, you never had that idea. That's 
interesting. It's a, it's a wonderful idea, right? You get a distribution, you can get a proof of something by assuming something is true that you want to prove is not true. You can prove that the square root of two is irrational by assuming it's rational, assuming it's the ratio of two relatively prime integers. That's a big idea. And to realize that Chinese have been doing uh, math for thousands of years, many thousands of years, and a lot of smart people, and you never had that idea, oh, that says something about the subtlety of the idea. And there's something there and that, you know, that, that's important. And so Fisher, Fisher uh, had this idea, because he was a mathematician, and he, and he, and he knew so sort of the, the Greek math, mathematicians' work as well. And this is just a comment that it's a special case of something that I regard as very, as very Bayesian. Uh, for those of you who, who like uh, Bayesian things, I, something I wrote about in Annals of Statistics in 1984. Uh, and Fisher obviously had this idea of what a causal effect is. Because he, in 1918, he had this, this sentence. If we say this boy has grown tall because he has been well fed, well, you're not merely tracing out the cause and effect. He's got cause and effect in there. So in the individual instance, the, we are suggesting that he might quite probably, horrible English. See, old, old, I mean, old English is almost as bad as old, old math. It's, it's got all, all this clutter of words that you don't really need. Suggest that he might quite probably have been worse fed. In this case, he would have been shorter. So the, an active treatment is well fed, control treatment poorly fed, and what's the cause effect of being well-fed versus poorly fed on his height? Well, being well-fed, he's this tall. Poorly fed, he's this tall. You can't go back in time and take away his feed. So the, the definition of the cause effect of being well-fed versus poorly fed is the comparison of something you can see with something you can't see. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist just because you can't measure it. It does exist, but you can't measure it. You can't measure the causal effect. You can measure either one you want, his height when being well-fed or his height when being poorly fed, but you can't measure the causal effect. Now, so this idea was growing in 1918 from Fisher and other people, but the, but the Copenhagen School of Quantum Mechanics was doing the same thing. They didn't talk to each other. The Danes didn't, didn't talk to the English about, about causal effects or quantum mechanics. They may have talked about quantum mechanics, but they didn't talk about it in the context of experiments. We'll see later that the guy who made up the formal notation originally was Polish. He wasn't talking to the Danes. But here, the, clearly, Fisher had the idea of this is what a causal effect is. It's not something that the probabilists ever had the idea about. The probabilists knew a hell of a lot about gambling and about error distributions in astronomy. You know, the, uh, Galileo, all these guys had great distributions for error distributions. Did they have any idea about interventions? Well, no, Galileo wasn't talking about interventions. And the, and the, and the, and the gamblers, the guys who probability grew out of gambling, they, was, they weren't talking about interventions either. You know, fertilizers or the philosophers tried to, but they screwed it up, like John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill talked about causality in terms of, if you do it, if, if when I open my fingers causes this to fall, it, it has to happen every time. If, if one time I opened my and didn't fall, that's not causal. So that's what Mill would say. Uh, who tried to use that as, as a defense? In, in a legal case. Tobacco. If smoking causes cancer, according to Mill, everyone who smokes will get lung cancer. So it's a good defense. If the greatest philosopher on causality says it's not causal, it's not causal. There are lots of people who smoke their whole lives, two packs a day, don't get lung cancer. They may live to 90 years old, they don't get lung cancer. So clearly, cigarettes don't cause lung cancer, according to John Stuart Mill. Okay, they don't cause lung cancer. So those suits should be dismissed. Didn't work. But clearly, Mill had something wrong. 
He didn't understand this idea. In the individual instance, you have to go back in time. What would his health have been like if he hadn't smoked, for example? You don't see it. It's not every time. That's, that, that's ridiculous. So Mill doesn't get it. The experimenters, the people who actually did breeding experiments with, with animals were a lot closer. If I breed a big bull with a big cow, I'll probably get a big calf. So if you, if you look back in, in, uh, in, in, with animals, the breeders understood what they were doing. They didn't have mathematics for it. They didn't have methods of inference for it. But they basically understood much better than the philosophers or the mathematicians or the probabilists. In fact, Fisher never had any explicit notation for formalizing non-null causal effects. He had formal notation under the null when nothing's going on, but he never had notation for under the null null. Despite his tremendous geometric insights under sharp null hypothesis based on symmetry arguments, all these symmetry arguments, which is basically the kind of arguments that take place in physics all the time. So who had the notation, the first notation? A strange guy named Jersey Naaman in a master's thesis in 1923. Naaman, Naaman Pearson, you know, most of what you probably learn in, in statistics is all this Naaman Pearson theory, which is basically a, a sequence of proofs of counterexamples to why it can't, well, showing why Naaman Pearson can't work in general. It's, it's, it's mostly silly, but it, it forms a, a basis of, of most of, of mathematical statistics now. And Naaman defined estimands, the quantities to be estimated, as functions of potential outcomes for the n units. So you have n, unit, n plots of land, and y0 is a, is a vector, a column vector of the uh, potential outcomes under the control treatment, and y1 is an array of potential outcomes under an active treatment, active fertilizer, old fertilizer, implicitly assuming something I call stable unit treatment value assumption. Basically just saying that the outcome yield of a plot, plot i, under treatment W, either 0 or 1, is a function of, of I and W, just a well-defined function. People publish the statistician types, especially in social science, publish stuff all the time not knowing what a function is. The Journal of the Royal Statistical Society just published stuff which is completely ridiculous, where people don't know what a function is. It's the function, that's all it's saying. Potential outcome has to be a function, so it has to be well-defined. And you can't observe both y1 and y0 on any one unit. That's the same as Heisenberg or observer effect, because you can't go back in time. Take, a plot, like take the ith plot of land, undo the fertilizer that was there, and apply the new fertilizer or the old fertilizer. You can't undo what was done. So this notation was a tremendous advance, because, and as far as I can see, it was the first time anybody put down notation that expressed this. And Naaman realized, this is his, his master's thesis in Poland in 1923, that you can't observe both. He didn't relate it to uh, quantum mechanics at all. He didn't make anything out of it. He just said, it's kind of interesting. You can't go back, you know, you can't measure them both. <laughs> Another great contribution is the evaluating the operating characteristics of procedures like estimators or interval estimates over the randomization distribution. So uh, unbiased estimate means if you look over all possible randomizations, the difference in averages, observed averages, will equal the true difference in, in, in uh, uh, causal effects across all the individual units. This eventually evolved into Naaman Pearson. In 1923, he'd never met Pearson. He didn't even speak English. He spoke Polish. Maybe, maybe he spoke French, but he certainly didn't speak, did not speak uh, English. <clears throat> but you can see the seeds of all of Naaman Pearson theory in this 1923 master's thesis. He also worried about the role of non-additive unit level causal effects. What's non-additive mean? If the treatment versus the control just adds a constant, the yield on, on one plot will be, let's say, five kilograms more under the active treatment than the control treatment. 
that five kilograms is the same for all the plots. That's what an additive treatment effect means. And, there's a, and the problem with that is he, he proved in 1923 that you can't even estimate the variability, like the variance of the difference in, in ex, observed means. Because it depends upon this thing you can't, you can't define. You can, you can define it, but you can't measure it. The, the, how big the not additive effect is. You can only, only measure it under assumptions. If you assume it's zero, then you can get an, an exact standard error, an exact sampling variance. But otherwise, you can't. Later in his uh, biography, uh, he denied the depth of understanding in 1923. He said, I was just fooling around with, with the mathematics. I didn't really understand what it all meant. And in fact, when, when, you, when you read the, the original article as translated, uh, you, you really can see that he's sort of flailing around and not really understanding what, what the depth of it is. But you also see that the, there were these essential ideas present. Uh, even though he said he really didn't understand what he, he, was, he was doing back then. So comments on these insights. I, I've already said this, but I think it's an important idea. These are 20th century insights like those in quantum mechanics. Estimands, things that we want to estimate. The average causal effect or the median causal effect across a series of plots or people are well defined in terms of measurable quantities which are not simultaneously measurable, even theoretically. You can't measure both your height being well fed and your height being poorly fed. But it's well defined. That's the same insight as, as quantum mechanics. Can you find, can, well, I can't find any reference to any ideas like this before the 20th century, before the, before the Copenhagen School in, in the early 1900s. Was Fisher really the first to, to uh, propose this? He wasn't the first to propose you know, drawing lots to see, to make it fair. The gamblers understood that. You go back to biblical times, you can see references to drawing lots to make decisions. But was he really the first person to actually recommend d learning about causal effects through randomization and to have this theory of getting significance levels? I think absolutely so. The, the only person that comes even close is a, is a guy who's pointed out to me by Steve Stigler, who's a historian of, of statistics, a guy named Peirce. That's a strange spelling for the name Peirce, but it's, it's what, that's how he pronounced his name, who's the son of a Harvard mathematician from the 1850s, who's a, a psychologist who, before, who proposed doing randomization in a psychophysical experiment. But the psychophysical was so people couldn't anticipate whether the, the object was lighter or heavier than the previous object. It wasn't part of inference. Uh, <clears throat> well, randomized clinical trials quickly after 1925, began to dominate agricultural and animal breeding. So there were the, the people who did agriculture and animal breeding understood experimentation. And here's an idea, oh, now if I do randomization, I can get unbiased estimates, I can get significance levels. That became very popular. And that's why he wrote a book called Design of Experiments in 1935. <clears throat> and this, and this uh, approach of randomized experiments quickly dominated uh, agricultural and animal breeding throughout the Commonwealth and the U.S. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure because Hong Kong was part of the Commonwealth, somebody here can find something that was being done in, in Hong Kong, maybe for fishing, maybe for animal breeding, I don't know, but it, was, but it spread very, very quickly. <clears throat> and much applied work, uh, names Cochran, Cochran, Kempthorne, Cochran, and Gertrude Cox, George Box, David Cox uh, in England, uh, was, was being done in experimental design. And supporting mathematical work was being done, for example, the Indian Statistics Institute by Mihaly Novus, R.C. Bose, Nair, C.R. Rao, a lot of Indian static, were doing the math, underlying mathematical work. And subsequently, randomized controlled trials entered Western industry. When you're building complicated machines, it, it helps to know is what, what kind of rubber should you use for tires for airplane tires or automobile tires, or what happens if you build an airplane with the wings in this shape or that shape? Those are empirical questions. And so randomized trials, when you have lots of, of interventions that you can use to modify the shape of an airplane, it really helps to be able to have some systematic way of looking through them. That's why randomized trials entered US industry. 
<clears throat> and in fact, at the end of World War II, when, we, when the West was rebuilding uh, Asia, in particular Japan, it entered Japanese industry. And in fact, since 1951, Japan has given a Deming Medal in Experimental Design and Quality Control. Deming was a, an American statistician who worked out of New York in, in Yale University, who was big into quality control and, and actual randomized experiments. So th that's what led to actually the Jap Japanese automobile industry building reliable cars. It wasn't because the Japanese were so smart. They were smart enough, however, to learn about experimental design and, and, to, and to learn how to, how to use that to build reliable cars. But, the lim but these insights were limited to randomized controlled trials with non-conscious units. So we're back to Julian Jaynes and, and, and the origin of consciousness. People have a problem that they think, at least conscious people think. Schizophrenics have a problem. Donald Trump has a problem thinking. <laughs> There's no doubt. I mean, he doesn't say anything, and he, he thinks you'll believe it. He sort of thinks he's like the Trojan horse example, right? I may give you a gift. You know, you'll take it. You know, you don't know. You're stupid. So what happens with, what, what, what happened to conscious units? Well, transporting transportation of the insights of randomized trials with conscious units came much later. As far as I can see, it came in medicine originally in England uh, in the late 1940s. Medical Research uh, Center, Sir Bradford Hill, and, uh, be, uh, antibacterial treatment for streptococcus. Uh, Salk vaccine is a huge randomized experiment done in the US in 1954 on Salk vaccine, uh, you know, giving vaccine to, to kids and the kids develop uh, less uh, uh, polio. Uh, in the US, the Food and Drug Administration and in uh, pharmaceuticals, this guy named Paul Meyer, Kaplan Meyer, survival curves. Paul Meyer really pushed very hard for the US FDA to only approve drugs based on randomized trials. And what the complication with, with randomized trials? Well, randomized trials had the complication that they're with people, and people have placebo effects. And they have Hawthorne effects. Hawthorne effects are in the industry, no matter what you do, and they, if you tell people they're in an experiment, it'll, they'll improve their behavior. So you, you can't just go in and say, oh, we made the lights brighter. Oh, look, they're working harder. So now you tell well, you're part of an experiment. We think the light's too bright. We can turn it down. They do better even if you're turning it back down to the same level it was before you did the first experiment. People being conscious are complicated. And so the, and, and we still don't, don't deal with it correctly, even if so at food and drug administration. We don't deal with it, meaning placebo effects and Hawthorne effects. But surprisingly, there were no use of these Fisher, Neyman insights or the notation in non-randomized controlled trials. Probably the most striking example of that, again, is, the, is cigarette smoking. So there's a 1964 Surgeon General's report in the US on cigarette smoking and lung cancer, which concluded that cigarette smoking contributes uh, to lung cancer. But how are these studies done? Well, have there, any, have there ever been any randomized experiments that shows that cigarette smoking increases the risk of lung cancer? with humans or animals? No. There's not a single randomized experiment that's ever been done that, that suggests that smoking causes lung cancer. Why not? Raised dogs in cages where they're just covered in smoke all the time. They get skin cancers. They, do they get lung cancer? Or rats? When do people get lung cancer typically? How old are they? And typically, when do they start smoking? They start smoking at 20, maybe 15. They get lung cancer if they do in their, maybe at the earliest in their 40s, 50s. So you have to be exposed to smoke apparently for 30, 40. What, who has a dog that's lived to be 30 or 40? Or a rat? I mean, Tortoises do, but it's hard, kind of hard to make a tortoise smoke, right? Or a whale, I don't know. It's, it's, so, it, but we, I think most of us believe that 
cigarette smoking is a cause of lung cancer. If somebody smokes his whole life, like three packs a day, he's probably more likely to get lung cancer than if he hadn't smoked. Again, this comparison with something you can see with something you can't see, which makes it very difficult. Instead, what epidemiology, study of diseases, economics, social science, they all used regression with these potential outcomes of YI1 and YI0 replaced by an observed outcome with an indicator for each unit. So this is this, this notation, YI OBS is an indicator, which is one if you got treated, and an indicator one minus, or one minus W, which is zero, if you got control. So you, you, you get this Y OBS equals Y1 if, if you got treated, equals Y0 if you got control. So this, this quantity, YI OBS, violates this, this principle of separating the science from what you do to learn about the science. YI1, the, y, the, the Ys are signs. They exist. You can't see both of them, but they exist. YI OBS, the observed value, you can see, but it's not, is it scientific? Or is it part of the, what you did to learn about the science? It sort of mixes them up, doesn't it? Because it's got the Ys that are the science, and it's got the W's that are what you did to learn about the science, which one you, which one you looked at. See, in, in a randomized experiment, the W is, is randomly assigned to zero or one. So that's what you do to learn about, about, about the science. So this vi violently violates the principle of separating the science from what we do to learn about the science. Yet this completely dominated, even in the Surgeon General's report, the way you did causality in observational studies. And, and this is a, a real mistake. Regression kind of things, prediction of why I obs is not the right way to think about causal inference. Yet it's what, and this is the same thing that underlies graphical models. If you look at a graphical model with arrows and nodes, the nodes are observed values. And it's bad. It's the wrong way to look at it. When I started doing this you know, stuff on causal inference in, in the 70s, I graduated, uh, got PhD in uh, 1970. Um, and this be eventually became known as Rubin Causal Model. It's a name Paul Holland made up in an 86 article in Jazz, I think. I started writing about this in 74 and 75 and 76, and a series of papers I wrote where I said, this is all obvious. This is just obvious stuff. This is a notation that, that you should use to, to define causality. It should be a comparison of potential outcomes, one of which you can never see, only one of which you can ever, ever observe. And this stuff was rejected all the time. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the wrong way. You should be doing it by regression. And I no, it's not. It's not right because you don't understand science. It's not the way science works. Uh, so basically, there were several contributions of, of this work. The, the idea of potential outcomes define causal estimates in all situations, not just in randomized experiments. So this, this notation that Neyman made up for randomized experiments was never used outside the context of randomized experiments. In epidemiology, it wasn't used. In economics, it wasn't used. In social science, psychology, it wasn't used. Everybody was using regression, trying to predict stuff. You still see it now. I, when I, I just came from uh, Stockholm about two weeks ago, where I was in a machine learning conference. And there was a workshop all day s Sunday, July 15th, on causality in, in um, machine learning. Machine learning is all based on prediction. And it's very good if you want to build a, 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 a machine that will beat a Go player. You can train it that, that way. But it's very different from learning about causal effects. And, that, and that's what this day was pretty much about. And the machine, some of the machine learners sort of get it. Some of them don't. Now, when I, I, when I, in the, about 1975 or 76, I don't remember the exact date, I was visiting Berkeley, and as a visitor, I had, uh, they gave me an office upstairs with a retired faculty. And one of the great things about having an office there is next door to uh, Naaman's. 
So he and I used to go to go to lunch together. And for example, he disagreed that these causal less demands should define causal effects in all, not just in randomized experiments. And he was dismissive of it because basically he said, I don't want to talk, let's talk about something more interesting. Let's talk about the stars. He was big into astronomy then. And he said, okay, so he was in his 80s, I was in my 30s or 20s. So you talk about what he wants to talk about, right? And so, because uh, he said basically, to even talking about ran uh, causal effects without randomization is too speculative. You really have no idea what you're talking about. One of the interesting things, in his 80s, he was still a chain smoker. And he would chain smoke straight through lectures. So he invited me to one of his, or the first lectures with his graduate students. And he chain, you know, you chain smokers, you take a cigarette, it's, it's running down. And before this one goes out, you take out another cigarette. And you put the new one in your mouth and you, and you use the old one to, to, to light it. So at the, at the front of the lecture, in front of the board, he was chain smoking. Oh. He didn't die of lung cancer. <laughs> Cochran did, because he, he too was a chain smoker. Uh, so I guess uh, smoking doesn't cause lung cancer because Neyman never got lung cancer. Another contribution of, of, of this work was that I, you need, in addition to the science, which is, it's out there, you need an assignment mechanism for causal inference. It's a probability distribution on the indicator W, who, gets, who got what treatment. Because that's what creates missing data how you decide which, which is missing. The, the outcome, the potential outcome under control or the potential outcome under treatment. So here are the, the quantity on the, on the right that you're conditioning on. That's the science. And this is what you got treated. And what's the big advantage of a randomized experiment? It's one line. It's unconfounded. So the treatment assignment doesn't depend upon the potential outcomes. It can depend upon blocking variables, covariates or blocks, but it can't depend upon something you haven't seen yet. Because these are future values. These are, these are values you will observe if, you, if W is 1. These are values you will observe if W, if w is 0 and if, if W is 1. But mathematically, that's perfectly fine. Right? It's, a, it's a probability distribution given, the, given the, the potential outcomes. And in a randomized experiment, one of the great things is it's unconfounded. This assignment mechanism doesn't depend upon the potential outcomes. You make treatment assignment decisions free of the outcomes that, that you're going to see. One of the great advantages, probably the greatest advantage of, of randomized experiments is that they're unconfounded. It's not that they're really randomized. It doesn't involve the outcomes. Now, with, with real data, like hospital records, claims data, or other, other data, doctors, do they make this decisions based that are unconfounded? When you go to a doctor, do you, do you hope that, they, that he'll randomly assign the treatment? That he, or what he, or do you really hope what he's doing is in his head, he's comparing your value under an, one treatment with your value under another treatment, your value being what the value of your health will be like in a year. And he hopes that he, he chooses the, the value of W such that it leads to the better outcome explicitly confounded. And that's why dealing with medical records from, from observational data is so difficult to reach correct conclusions. Because we hope that doctors are making choices that they think are good for you. And not just doing it randomly or making choices that are bad for you. Or even, even if it's not doctors, people making decisions about what fertilizer to use. They're making decisions in observational studies that are designed to optimize what they think is going to happen. It's not a prediction problem. So in, in non-randomized studies, you have to worry about why it's not randomized. And there are various things that I defined in, in, these, in these papers having to do with more subtle kinds of assignments, for example, in a sequential experiment, how, how, you, how you do this, where the, out, where the next treatment may, decide, may depend upon what you've observed among uh, earlier, earlier units. 
What Bayesian does, another contribution of the sequence of papers, primarily in seven, 1975 and 1978 in the Annals of, of Statistics, Bayesian models the science. So it, it, it sub, Bay, what Bayesian inference does is supplement the assignment mechanism with a model on the signs. That's all Bayesian inference does. It models everything and, and, and generates predictions, essentially, of the missing potential outcomes from the observed potential outcomes and the observed treatment assignments. Uh, it's tricky because it, it, it requires more of an artistic touch than, obviously, inference in, um, in experiments. So this is sort of uh, and it creates it points out the fundamental problem facing causal inference is something that I phrase I made up in 1975. It's a missing data problem. For each unit, you get to observe only y1 or y0. So if a unit got exposed to the active treatment, the first three here, you get to observe y1, and this is missing. If you got exposed to the control treatment, what well, you get to observe y0. You don't get to observe y1. And the and see, in some sense, it's sort of obvious that a random assignment of active versus control implies a representative sample of Y1 values will be compared to a representative sample of Y0 values. Sort of obvious, isn't it? If I want to say have a representative sample of Y1 and a representative sample of Y0, once I've written it this way, it's sort of obvious that this is the way you should learn about causal effects. Well, it's obvious why it take thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, you know, 90 some thousand years for humans to see it. And why they we only proposed randomization when Fisher proposed it in 1925. The point is you have to model the assignment mechanism to draw inference about the missing potential outcomes. And that's what the causal inference really is. It's drawing inferences about the missing values so you can estimate causal effects. It's a mistake to regress the observed value of Y on an indicator for what treatment you got and, and you cover and back whether you're male or female or healthy or sick. That it doesn't work in general. This approach loses the potential outcomes in these key Fisher name and concepts when you use this observed value notation. It mixes the assignment and mechanism of the science, which is the wrong thing to do. It suppresses these key insights. There's no missing data. So what are you going to estimate if you, if you replace both potential outcomes by the observed value? I guess there must be parameters in some silly model. Even though I don't believe the parameters exist, uh, but that's, if I'm doing it by regression, it's got to be regression coefficients or something like that, I guess. So it just leads to total confusion once you lose these insights that, that Fisher and, and Neyman have. But it became standard in biostatistics, economics, epidemiology, everywhere. And even great statisticians and epidemiologists like Fisher, Cochrane, and a guy named Cornfield, who I'll talk about in a second, confused themselves with this observed value notation. So observed value notation is wrong, yet it led to prediction using regression or splines or machine learning algorithms. That's not the point. The point is it's doing, it's the wrong conceptual thing to do. You've lost the insight. Once you reduce the potential outcomes to the observed value and have indicator variables for, uh, for the treatments, you, 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 you lost. And even Fisher and Cochrane and this guy Cornfield confused themselves. And I'll just give um, one, one quote from, from Cornfield. Cornfield was an American epidemiologist, very smart guy who is the guy who initiated, or is very key in the, in the uh, uh, tobacco, anti-tobacco smoking. So it's a bad, this re reduction to the observed value notation was a bad influence on observational studies. First of all, there was no design phase. They stopped worrying about how to design experiments, just have a data set and start analyzing it. And the analyses were typically confused. And it modeled, it confused association versus causation. There's all the, if you look back at textbooks, for example, that were written uh, in these uh, different applied uh, fields and also in, in statistics fields about the difference between causation and association, they'll say, uh, association is not causation. But then they won't say what the right thing to do is. And they don't say why it isn't. Because they're not even using the notation that was established for randomized experiments. Back in the 
30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, people who did observational studies never used the same notation as people use in randomized experiments. So they never could define causal inference correctly. A, 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 a striking example of that is what's called, often called case control studies, or I, they're really more accurately called case non-case studies. Because the control in the case control study is not a person assigned the control treatment. It's a person without the disease. So a case in a case control study is a person with lung cancer, for example, and a control is a person without lung cancer. So it's the out, they're defining it by the outcome variable, not by what you got exposed to. And the, but there's a sampling mechanism that's, that, that samples the, the treated, the people who were cases and the pieces who, people who were controls. You get all the cases of lung cancer, or you get all the, pe or the, the, all the people who got food poisoned. And then you try to find out where they ate. It's a very intuitive thing to do. It's just wrong. If you, if you have a bunch of people who got food poisoned, you'd like to find out where they ate to find out what caused the food poisoning. But the cases here are people who got the disease. You don't know what they got, where they ate. That's a different issue. It's more complicated. So the way they tried to fix this problem in the 50s and, and 60s and 40s 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, even now. It's still the, the, the standard tool in epidemiology is to do it by regression. You, you regress yi obs on the indicator w, which is wrong, because you've gotten rid of the potential outcomes. And here's an example of what, what illustrates it. They try to fix it with regression. We now consider, this is from Cornfield, 1959. Remember, Cornfield was this very smart epidemiologist, statistician, who was the, the, was the main, in fact, he, he did battle with Fisher on did smoking cause lung cancer. He wrote something in 1959 called on <laughs> Principles of Research. We now consider the distinction between the kinds of inferences that can be supported by observational studies not, not randomized, whether prospective or retrospective. Prospective means that you're looking forward in time. So you have uh, people and you, and you see what, you, some who got exposed to something, some who got exposed to the control, and then you see who gets disease. That's a prospective study. A retrospective study is a case control. We look at people who are diseased, and we get a collection of people who are not diseased, and we do the regression that way. But it's still doing regression. It's still a binary regression on an indicator variable. So it's kind of inferences that can be supported by observational studies, not randomized, whether prospective or retrospective, and those that can be supported by experimental studies, randomized experiments. That there is a distinction seems undeniable, but its exact nature is elusive. Well, let's, see, let's investigate that a little bit. What's the, what's the difference between a randomized experiment? Well, it's a randomized experiment. It's unconfounded. Can't depend upon the potential outcomes. Because I make the treatment assignments, maybe have a different probability of being treated versus control if you're a man or a woman, or if you're a sandy plot or a, or a, or a, a, a plot that's dry. But the assignment is, is unconfounded. In an observational study, you don't know it's unconfounded. So when you look at a doctor's office, maybe the doctor th is making, assigning one treatment to people who are older or sicker or some other un unobserved quantity. You don't know it's unconfounded. It, it can depend upon uh, potential outcomes. So it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not uh, obscure. The difference is not obscure. It's this, it's just this, this state, whoops. That's the statement here. And uh, I, I, I guess I, I could also point out other people, like even, even Fisher made mistakes because he didn't, he didn't use the notation. Why didn't he use this, this great notation that was due to Naaman? Well, Naaman and Fisher hated each other. So why use a notation that your enemy made up? You have to cite him, maybe. Fisher never cited Naaman. He hated him. They're very different personalities, you know. Fisher was a sort of a 
a very gruff uh, Englishman. And, and Naaman, I, 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 I never met, met Fisher, but I, but I, I did uh, meet Naaman, and Naaman was a charming guy. He was a you know, you know, uh, European with all sorts of good humor and always smoking cigarettes and stuff. Very much a ladies' man, so he was, he was a charming guy. But, but Fisher was, was not very, very, very different people. So, but Fisher made mistakes, Naaman made mistakes, not always for the same reason. Cochrane made mistakes, and these are, these are published mistakes. That, that, that are published in, 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 in books. And they, because they didn't, they, eventually they confuse themselves with the observed value notation. Um, it, I, I talk about the mistakes that, some of the mistakes Fisher made in a, in a Fisher lecture that I gave for the um, American Statistical Association in 2004, where Fisher screwed up direct and indirect causal effects. He gets it completely wrong. Uh, and he, but he, and he wasn't just one mistake, he had it like in four editions of, his, of, his, of both books, Design of Experiments and um, uh, Statistical Methods for Research Workers. So I uh, already, already talked about this one, yeah, so let me go forward again. So these are starting conclusions. What I mean by starting conclusions <clears throat> is uh, based on, on this background that I, that I, that I, that I, I was describing earlier, if you want to think, start thinking about causal inference, these are the, you have to start here, I think. And then you can go into more, more details and, and, and more specific examples. You should retain key insights from the past. I mean, like, what, like what are these insights and why uh, understanding causal inference took thousands and thousands of years to even get a formal structure for? You retain them. Get rid of confusion from the past. Get rid of the fact that regression can get, get causal inference. It's not, it's not right, what re, regression can't in, in general. Maybe it can in specific cases. You know, there are lots of things that we can do wrong that get the right answer. But, but if they're wrong in general, don't do them. Or at least if you're going to do them, understand what you're doing and, and, and avoid doing it when, when it won't get the uh, right. Also realize the whole ideas underlying randomized controlled trials are extremely recent. In the history of mankind, mankind goes back 100,000 years. These are maybe 100 years old or 120 years old. They're very recent. And before that, we didn't understand. <clears throat> we may have been doing some things right. The experimentalists may be doing some things right. It doesn't mean they had the deep understanding that, that, that arose from, from Fisher and Neyman's insights. And, and Fisher and Neyman weren't always right, as I, as I point out. You should update statistical methods in both design and analysis to take advantage of modern computing environments. <clears throat> there, there are many important ideas in statistics that have been uh, fostered, that are possible to do much better because of modern computing. And you should take advantage of them. And some of these, you say, well, why didn't Fisher think of that? Or why didn't Naaman think of that? Why didn't these brilliant guys think of it? They, they may have. But then they say, you can't do it because it's too, you can't possibly do, it, do the computation. We can now do things on our cell phones that you couldn't do 30 years ago, even on, on, on a mainframe computer. I mean, I remember when, when I was uh, at Princeton, we, Princeton had a huge computer. It was about the size of this room. It was an IBM 7094. It had 36-bit uh, words, and I think it had 38,000. 36-bit words, and tape drive, spinning tape, all over, about the size of this room. And you turn in a deck of cards. I mean, it was completely different. Computing has made tremendous ad advances and should update statistical methods for both design and analysis to take advantage of these in, uh, improvements. Also, you should encourage mathematical precision, especially in notation and logical flow. I don't mean mathematical precision in getting all the epsilon delta arguments right, and that's just tedious nonsense. I mean, it's, it's sure, it, yeah, get it right. You you don't want to make mistakes, but that's not where ideas are. Understand the big, big deep ideas like proof by contradiction, induction's another big idea. Proof by induction. Understand these ideas, these mathematical ideas, and be precise about them. Being precise can have critical consequences for challenging applications. And if, for example, one of the challenging applications I think we're now facing is separating placebo effects from active drug effects. 
which I think is very important in, in the process of, 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 of approving drugs. So anyway, these are just some, some starting conclusions uh, which, which I think are important for understanding essential concepts of causal inference. Essential concepts are not regression, but it's comparing, it's this idea of comparing something you can observe with something you can't observe. But you can observe either one, you can't observe them simultaneously. And realize that these ideas are actually very, very recent in, in the history of mankind. Thanks very much. Do I have questions? So I'm a bit intrigued by one of the examples you used, uh, the food poison. Uh, so if you want to yep. chase out uh, you know, what you have eaten, uh, mm -hmm. cause the problem, do you think this is like causal, causal inference? Or because you are not doing randomized uh, uh, clinical trial, randomized experiment, no, it, it, it is a causal in inference problem. Uh, what, I, what I'm saying is that it's a causal inference problem where the assignment mechanism is confounded. So it makes it much more complicated. So you, you can't just simply use the same methods that work for randomized experiments because you're dealing with a completely different distribution for the indicator variable of how you got treated. And so there, you, you have to do the kinds of analyses that are, are appropriate for the way the data were collected. And a, uh, in these case control studies, like food poisoning, uh, that's about the only way you can collect the data is to do it in this awkward way. You get everybody uh, who's, who got food poisoned, and then you tr try to look around for, for people who didn't get food poisoning and try to find out the reason. Uh, I've, been a, a consultant, I've been a consultant on various problems like this, for example, at the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, I think about 10 years ago, they found out that there were a lot of people were getting a very serious eye disease that maybe uh, made them go blind. Uh, and they found out that everybody who was going blind used contact lenses. And everybody who was going blind used Bosch and Loam No More Tears uh, uh, fluid to clean the contact lenses. And then you started looking, looking deeper, and you, and you found out that, that not everyone who used Bosch and Loam got, got eye disease. And then you tracked further, and you find out, find out that only the No More Tears contact lens cleaner that was manufactured in a particular plant in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, was infected. So I'm not saying that, 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 uh, that you can use the same methods but you have to be clear that there's a big distinction between a, a design that is unconfounded, like a randomized experiment, and one that, that's confounded. And the confo there are lots of different types of confounded uh, designs. And we've done very little because you try to use the same, because regression is basically based on this idea that you've got all the, all the confounders, that you can, can analyze everything as if it's a ran complicated randomized experiment. That's not true. So, so another question, uh, probably is slightly, uh, you know, not related to causal. Uh, you know the paper by Valen Johnson about the p-value, uh, like uh, the significance level. You know, he want to change 0.05 to 0.05 or 0.01. So there are a lot of debating yeah. about uh, uh, hypothesis testing whether you should use a more stringent uh, criteria to reject the null to establish, to establish uh, say, causal inference. Uh, so what is, what is your comments on that? My comment on that is that it basically, it's uh, uh, a minor suggestion on, on how to Im Im improve practice. But, but the, even though the significance level is a great idea, it, it's, not the, it's not the answer. So I, I think to, to get answers to, uh, to questions that are more complicated, you, you really have to uh, become much more Bayesian. And everything I've talked about so far, almost, almost everything I've talked about so far here has been very uh, Fisherian, so very, very uh, almost fiducial. Um, but uh, I, I think you have to, so Bayesian things allow you to bring in a lot more science. I think you have to, have to rely much, much more on science. And, and the p-value doesn't, doesn't take you very far. And in fact, I've, I've, I've been involved in, in a variety of things at Food and Drug Administration, given the short courses there and uh, been on committees. Uh, and it's, they're, they're never so naive as to rely completely on p-values. 
So I think the whole debate about just changing the, the level of the p value is sort of silly because nobody takes it that seriously anyway. It's sort of a, a debate by, by people who, who don't really do statistics, real, real statistics, but they argue about it. You, you may have answered this in your previous answer, but the, uh, this confounding, uh, it's, uh, isn't this what they uh, tried to uh, overcome by throwing in a, a whole lot of other uh, uh, variables to, that, that might have had an influence? Uh, do you think that uh, that's, that's the purpose of, of that? Project? That's right, that's the purpose of that, and so you're throwing more and more variables into the X. And you think the more and more variables you, you throw in, the more likely you've satisfied un unconfoundedness. And that, that's good intuition. There are, other, there are a lot of other things that, that, that people can do. So for example, the economists, uh, since Havlow and Tinberg in the 30s and 40s, have used something called instrumental variables, where they, instead of, they replace this unconfoundedness assumption with uh, another assumption that it would be unconfounded if you had something measured that, um, that, is, uh, is, uh, that you want to control for, and you, and you do um, adjustments, which are called instrumental variable adjustments. The thing that's the instrumental variable is the randomization indicator. So, and, and basically, it's saying that there are no direct effects of the randomization on this, this other variable, which is, which is the, the, the simplest example is a compliance indicator. So are you a, if you're a, a person in a randomized experiment and you're a non-complier, so I encourage you to take the drug, but you, don't, you throw the pill down the toilet. It's, ba it's basically it's a way of dealing with that. The problem with those kind of analyses, they're all based on least squares. It's, it's you know, 50, 70, 80, 100,000, 200-year-old method of, of analysis where the estimators, the instrumental variable estimator, has no moments, it has no mean, no variance, and so they, they and they waste their time proving theorems about the convergence and distribution. It's just a good idea, but but silly silly methods of analysis. Again, methods of analysis, they're okay in the 40s when nobody had computers, but they, but they're silly now. So there, there are other things that, that you can do be, besides fool around with the unconfoundedness assumption. I, I'm a physicist, and I, I think that causality is a very deep question in physics. Mm. And I always thought about this problem. I think that uh, I tell my students that uh, all causes start with Big Bang. Can you comment on that? So we, well, the, the sense was all, all causes start with the Big Bang? Why not? I mean, <laughs> It's a story, right? And then I have the opportunity to talk to the uh, father of fuzzy logic. Uh, uh, I think he died recently, um, Saturday. And um, I'm I sorry, I, I didn't understand. I have the opportunity about yeah. ten years ago to yeah. talk to the father of fuzzy logic, fuzzy logic, uh, Saturday. Yeah, and I... With Zada? Yeah, yeah. and okay. he, it, he told me that... So did I. I. I had an opportunity to cover so to Yeah, talk. and... So I, my attitude was he was confused. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so I, his I logic know. was very fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what he told me is this story. He asked me, what is the cause of the uh, fall of uh, the Soviet Union? The four part well, that, of that, that, what that illustrates is, is, is a question that has no answer. Yeah. Because, you, you know, what I've talked about here was the cause and effect of specific interventions. The question that you just asked was, what is the cause of an event? It has, it's undefinable. Yes. What's, what, so I, I get lung cancer. And someone says, oh, you got lung cancer because you smoked. No, no, no. I didn't get lung cancer because I smoked. I got lung cancer from my parents smoked. And if, if they hadn't smoked, I wouldn't have smoked. So the real cause of my lung cancer was my parents smoked. That's an infinite regress that, that goes, the Greeks talked about that. Yes, so the ultimate problem is that uh, do you really believe in the uh, probability interpretation of quantum mechanics? I mean, is the stake of, uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, at the Big Bang, is it a pure stake or a mixed stake? 
I, well, the, when, when I talked about quantum mechanics, I was only talking about it to sort of motivate this uh, position that there are things that you can define that you can't measure simultaneously. You can define it in, in terms of, of quantities that we, that we act as if, I'm not saying that's really true, that we act as if they both exist, like position and momentum. But you get to, you can't measure them precisely both at the same time. Y1 and Y0, the, the potential outcome you observed if you were, were well fed versus your height, if you were poorly fed, you can't observe both of those because you can't go back in time. That's the only point of that. Because I, I stopped doing, doing physics uh, when I get out of college. So I, I'm, I, again, I, I said a couple times, I'm not saying any, that, that anything that I was saying was true, it's tr but I, it's what I believed. And so it, it was an attitude towards, towards why this, this structure for, for causal inference was very natural to me. So I'm not talking about Big Bang. Do we have a, a clear and a formal definition of the casualties, just like how, how define the conditional probability? So is there a mathematical way to define the casualty? Sometimes because I personally, I will suffer from uh, how to how to tell the correlated data and the casualty data. So is, is there any question? Uh, any I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. You said, do we have a way of, of defining? Well, you yeah. know, you, you go Cormel Gorfer, you can def define conditional probability that way. Uh, if you, are you talking about the philo philosophical definition? Uh, I, mean, I mean, if I get a data set, mm -hmm. uh, there are many factors. Uh, how can some data, some data are correlated? Some factors are correlated. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe maybe I cough, and maybe uh, uh, just like the cough and the non-cancer is correlated. We, we can see that the cough leads to the cancer. Cough non leads to cancer. I don't cancer. think so. Yeah, but they are, they are they are highly correlated. If we, we yeah, get, yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. The rooster crows and the sun goes up. Right. Yeah, That's yeah, another so, great example. So, 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 the, so the, the crowing of the rooster causes the sun to rise. So. If, if I mean, because I'm from the machine learning community, yeah. yeah. Uh, here's here, here's my problem. If I I make a model, the model only can see the data sets. They, they only see the person coughs and uh, have cancer or not. Mm -hmm. So if I want to teach the computer to do the casually casual inference, do you have some comments? So they, they cannot they, they, this model cannot solve from the correlated data, uh, but uh, to do the real casual inference. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you're you're completely from the machine learning perspective, and you and and you haven't understood anything about the statistical perspective. Machine learning guys only care about prediction, right? That's primarily yeah. that's that's their big tool, and they have deep learning algorithms that yeah. that that that, are, that can beat the best chess players and the best go players and other other stuff. But it's it's very different from learning about interventions. In fact, if you'd gone to this conference in, in Stockholm, there's a, all day Sunday was about machine learning and how they don't get there in causality. They learn, you're playing different games. The game that you're playing, the machine learning game, can be useful in causal inference in, in predicting the, the missing potential outcomes. But it's not the same game. OK, so, okay thank you. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, actually, I have one question. Sure. Right? Yeah. Actually, the best way to learn is from history. I've learned a lot of history. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I didn't realize most of the time I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but given that uh, we're doing the wrong thing, do we get things right? Yeah. You know, to get the right answer, we might do, you mentioned that you know, yeah. we might doing things wrongly, but do we get the correct answers or approximately? Sometimes, you, sometimes, sometimes we do. Yeah. But I think we want to understand what the right thing to do is, even if it's too hard to do. Right. So I, I, I think that I mean, some of these approaches that, that they mentioned are very hard to implement in practice. But I also think that learning how to do them well, you need to work on real problems. So, so what's happening in FDA? What, what uh, you know, it's oh, like it clinical trials? Uh, well, in, in, in clinical trials there, I'm, I'm, in, I'm involved in, in uh, uh, some projects that involve huge placebo effects, for example. One of these projects is there's a, uh, a Dutch company that's trying to uh, get patents on um, the female Viagra, so the female sex-enhancing drug. Uh, and there'd be big, big bucks if they could get it to work. But they, it's, this company is called Emotional Brain, 
because in fact, females' brains are much more complicated than ma males' brains, <laughs> as far as sex goes, at least. <laughs> and so Viagra works for males. It, it works in the same way for females in terms of, of the physical reaction, but it doesn't have the same of effect on uh, the results that you want. So the different parts of the brain that light up for males and females. So uh, let's uh, give uh, Professor Dan Rubia a uh, uh, big thanks. Thanks. Thank you.